Welcome to the Story Copywriter Podcast. The show that teaches you everything you need to know to write stories that sell and become the written voice of a business you love. With me, your host and founder of Story Copywriters, Rob Drummond. I believe that writing a book is one of the best ways to tell your story and attract new clients into your world, people who resonate with your story and share your values. And we explored that in detail on episode 28 of the Story Copywriter podcast. On today's episode, I interview Vicky Fraser. Uh, so Vicky is a copywriter or former copywriter who now specializes as a book coach for nonfiction authors. And our topic today is Mighty Microbooks. A microbook being a small book that delivers a large amount of punch, that delivers a real transformation for the exact person that you're trying to help. So if the idea of writing a book feels daunting, I think you'll get a lot from today's conversation. So let's jump in. So let me tell you about uh, a problem that I have at my home. That um, my home is basically being taken over by books because <laughs> I buy books about ten times. Well, since I've had kids, it used. To, I think I used to buy books about five times faster than I read them. It's, I now buy books between ten and twenty times faster than I read them, and then. Even when I decide that I want to read more, the act of reading exponentially increases the number of books that I buy. And then I've kind of moved away from buying Kindle books because if I buy Kindle books, I forget about them. Whereas if I buy a paperback book, it's there sitting on the shelf. It's looking at me saying, you know, it's there reminding me. So what what I tend to do now is the book comes through. I'll sometimes scan it. I'll like give it a sniff because I'm weird like that. I'll read the I'll read the start. I'll read the ending, and then I'll shelve it for for later. And I, I, I'd say I'll read most of them. But I think there's something in it for me that was like a book. There is something about books that kind of conveys authority. And I think if you go back to the stem of author being tied to authority, like that, I think carries a lot of weight for me. Mm-hmm. So I keep coming back to books. And yeah. I think I think. Um, Daniel Priestley talks about this and key person of influence. And he says that, you know, if you want to be the authority in your niche, then you really need to have to have a book. Um, so having said all that, uh, you know, I mean, so this is what for, for anyone listening, we're talking to, to Vicky Fraser today. And um, mm-hmm. Vicky is a book coach. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know, I guess as this is the story copywriter podcast, perhaps you could talk through for anyone listening, you know, a, a slice of your story and how you got into your business as it is today yeah I there are I, there are so many things I could say about this um thank you for having me on for a start um literally everything you just said I'm like you're the boy version of me because <laughs> I have so many books and before we even start I'm actually gonna recommend to you this beautiful little book which is great for radio um it's called uh, on reading yes. by Nick Parker yes. and he talks about his problem that we share which is like mm-hmm. too many books and um basically don't worry about it and just keep buying books and then mm. read them however you fancy but anyway that's not what you asked me so my wife Lindsay like she literally rolls her eyes every time a new book comes in um but you know yeah she likes it to be all tidy and that's every book actually be on the bookshelf not just in a pile of in a pile on top of or next to the bookshelf which is now where they are oh my god that drives my husband nuts as well he's like could you stop with the horizontal filing and why are there now new piles of books and it's just like and so I have that like I have just stuff everywhere but also I get really stressed out when it's messy so I my life is very stressful um but anyway you asked where I came from so yeah I am hi I'm Vicky I'm a book coach um, and a writing coach. And I started off as a copywriter, um, much like your good self, um, until one day somebody said, can you write me a book? Can you go write me a book? And in my head, I was just like, I have no idea how to do that. And out of my mouth came, yes, absolutely. Um, and so I wrote my first book. For I'm a recovering else. people pleaser as well. So. <laughs> yeah, it was partly people pleasing and partly just like, you know, you know what? I've always wanted to do this, so I'm just going to give mm. it a go. Um, and so I was like, I'm going to have to learn how to do this. And I've still got that book and I'm really proud of it. And it's it's very, I would say it's 
amateurish because it's not but it's it's um not what I would do now let's put it that way um and I loved it so much I was like this is fantastic um I wonder if I can write my own book and so I did um and I obviously did a lot of kind of reading around how do I do this how do I do this and um there's some great stuff out there like there's some really great books on writing loads of really great books on writing there's some really great books on how to write books but there wasn't quite what I needed um and so I thought you know what? I'm going to write um my own book about how to write a book and that actually wasn't my first book I wrote a different book which was my first book but the the my kind of book that I hang my business off now I wrote because it was the book that I wanted to read um and so that kind of got me started off on coaching people because people gradually started coming to me it's like oh can you show can you help me write a book um and I was like yes I probably can um and so that's what I do now I love it I love seeing I love helping people get their stories out into the world and getting their books out into the world if no one else has written the book that you want to read then maybe that's a sign that you need to write it yourself yeah absolutely and you know I I think there's I was talking to somebody else the other day um, and he was asking about, you know, reader personas and stuff. And you can you can do all of that, like marketing avatar stuff and, you know, blah, 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 whatever. But honestly, I think if you have an idea that you can't see anywhere else and you would like to know more about it, then don't wait for somebody else to do it. Like write it yourself. Um, mm. there's, there's no reason why not. And you you then get to kind of write about it from your experience and your point of view. And you're not like nobody is a special snowflake however much we like to think so there is always going to be other people out there who are similar enough that they will want your perspective on things and so yeah get like write the book that you want to read <laughs> yeah I think people are both more similar and more different to us than we um realize so on a sort of we kind of assume that people share more of our opinions and biases and perspectives and whatnot whereas actually they don't however when you do something that really just is kind of you think it's unique to you like I remember um, I used to run from Sheffield City Centre home um, in the middle of winter and I was like, surely I am the only person uh, in Sheffield that does this. And then one day I ran past another runner who was also running up this massive hill in about two degree snow almost. And like we looked at each other. It's like, there's another nutter that thinks this is a good idea. It's like, well, actually, there's more people who are similar to you than you realise, but mm. we're also more different yeah yeah definitely and I I love that as well because I love it when I see somebody who like they just do something like yesterday for example I was I was teaching um I teach trapeze in my spare time um and I was doing the warm-up and the girl I suddenly noticed the girl in front of me was wearing a Buffy the Vampire Slayer t-shirt and she was probably half my age but I was so she would not have watched it first time around but I was just like teacher and it just was it's like a little moment of delight like there is a person who at least one thing we've got in common and it's quite a nerdy thing and so you know I could have a conversation with that person about Buffy the Vampire so and it's just, I love that those moments of recognition and connection I always thought I was the only barefoot running in Sheffield and then actually I realized that we're actually quite a common breed there's, there's quite there's quite a lot of us well that's um, like the confirmation bias isn't it you see one and then they're everywhere <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Is um is coaching and teaching like an input? So you're a trapeze coach, you're also a book coach, and you've kind of moved into coaching instead of doing client work and doing the copywriting. Um, is yeah. that something that's also quite important to you? Yeah, it really is because I realize that as much as I I like I love creating my own stuff and I write my own books and I write my own essays. I'm doing an MA in creative writing, so I'm doing all that, but like and I love performing on trapeze as well but what I really love as well at least as much is seeing people have breakthroughs and so in trapeze is a really like easy like visual for people it's like people struggling with a move like it's like oh, I want to do this move I want to do this move and you're like oh try this tweak try that tweak and then suddenly you come up with something that and they just get it they just get it like that and you see them suddenly be able to do something that they couldn't do before it's such a great feeling like it's a great feeling for them but for me it's like oh, I help them do that that's very cool and it's the same with um book coaching and writing coaching it's mm. like people will be like oh you know I'm not sure I'm not sure I can do this um and like for example I was working with somebody who has been trying to write his book for he said like three and a half years and he booked a VIP day with me and by the end of like and that was like in November and he has finished his first draft now and and so I was just like that is That's so like cool. doing trapeze though for someone for someone who isn't a writer um like I think writing a book is well it is a big thing and maybe we can get into that in a sec but like for someone who isn't a writer like that is like doing trapeze and all of a sudden they're doing trapeze yeah yeah definitely and you know a lot of people they think I mean writers write um 
and that is as simple as that but like a lot of people and I know it's easy to say that because a lot of people come to me and they're like oh I'm not a writer but I really want to write a book and so like one of the things one of my jobs is not so much to get the book written that's that's fairly obvious but it's like it's helping them to switch that mindset of like this is this is a person that I can become this is a person that I am and this is a thing that I can do um and kind of changing them from you know seeing that transformation of of I'm not a writer to oh my god I'm a writer I'm doing it is very mm. very cool and it opens mm. a lot of doors for other stuff as well yes I think um every time I talk to clients about writing a book there's a few things that they push back on one is that they think no one well firstly they, they think they don't have anything interesting to say which is obviously false they think that their story is boring or routine which is obviously false they think it's too much work too much time which maybe mm, true maybe true maybe true so the thing that triggered this conversation was you put up a post on linkedin about micro books mm. and more specifically about mighty micro books and i wondered if you could talk through what that means yeah so I am sure that you like me have read books that could have been a blog post <laughs> um and they are and I actually think this comes from the traditional publishing rules it's like oh you know a a novel has to be like a hundred thousand words and um a non-fiction book has to be 60 to eighty thousand words and my question is why like why because mm -hmm. sometimes I think authors and I don't even blame the authors most of the time it's like they've, they've got this publishing deal and they're publisher is expecting 80,000 words and so they're like crap I've got this idea how am I going to fill this book and so it ends up being filled with fluff and filler and if you're a certain type of um, writer or marketer it just becomes an extended sales letter that is actually of limited value for the reader mm. um, and that really it really pisses me off to be honest because I think it's disrespectful to the reader it's like for me a book can be an incredibly useful marketing tool and incredibly use but it's, that shouldn't it shouldn't be an extended sales letter you know it's like if somebody is committing to reading a book that's actually a really respectful thing to do and I don't want to abuse their time by spending They're the whole investing thing their to... time and therefore their life into yeah. paying attention to you and you're wasting that time by filler because you you're trying to adhere to what you perceive are the is the kind of done thing for the medium exactly exactly and some of it is because you're trying to adhere to the done thing for the medium some of it is because you're literally contracted to write that many words and you know that's a problem a different problem um but some of it is you know literally that people have heard and I've heard people say this so oh, it doesn't matter if anybody it doesn't matter if your book's crap and nobody reads it you just need to have a book and that's another thing that gives me the rage and it's like mm. no that's it's a a waste of trees <laughs> uh, it's a waste of of everybody's time and it's like if you're going to write a book even a crap book is, is a difficult thing to do. So like, why not just do the difficult thing and make it a good book? And so that was kind of what got me thinking about, you know, I'd read this, actually, it wasn't even a bad book that I'd read. It was, and because this is no shade on um, Mike Michalowicz at all. He's, he wrote Profit First. It's a great book, but the vast majority of that book is not for me because I am not a numbers person. And I'm like, it just sounds like blah, blah, blah. You just but need the big idea of having a yeah. few different accounts and paying yourself first and moving yeah. money into the tax accounts and so the profit accounts. And that's basically it. Literally changed my life. Like literally changed my life. Yeah, since I, made, I implemented that. Yeah. Like yeah. I've never had to worry about money again since I implemented that. I realized that's a very privileged thing to say, but because like all of the rest of it, I was bad with money and now I'm not. Um, and so if he had like, I'm not saying that the rest of his book was fluff and filler, but if he turned the first three chapters into a micro book, I'd be all over that. And I bet a lot of other people would as well. So he could, that's an extra book for him if he wanted it. He's got a very compelling story at the outset of that where his, his five-year-old comes up to him with a piggy bank. And um, I, I forgot the gist of the story now, which is a shame. But um, yeah, he's got, he's got a very compelling story about his daughter coming up to him and having multiple piggy banks for like her savings and this is for this and this is for this and he realizes well maybe I should just run my business like this as well yeah that's and see that's really cool and that's the kind of story that is perfect to lead into any kind of a book you know but particularly a micro book so yeah that was what I was thinking was that was the thing that I thought oh that could have been a tiny book and I would have read the whole thing because I've not read the rest of his book and it's not his fault it's my fault I'm just not interested in it um but yeah I had thought you know what other ideas could be you know tiny little ideas and so George Orwell's politics and the English language which I was writing about today was another one and it's like I mean technically I think it back in the day that would have been a blog post right but he didn't yeah. have blogs back then um so he published it as a pamphlet and he had all sorts of other ideas um I've got a book called am I allowed to swear on your podcast uh, yeah <laughs> not, 
I've got a, a little book called fucking apostrophes which I love and it's like a grammar book but it's literally just about apostrophes and it's quite sweary um and it's like once you've read that you know how to use apostrophes and you also know that there aren't really any fixed rules grammar changes and all the rest of it so that was a perfectly tiny idea this book that I was just talking about on reading is Nick Parker's thoughts on ha- pr- provocations, consolations, and suggestions for reading more freely. And it's just his thoughts on reading. It's not a how-to, it's like a little book of thoughts. And again, it's perfect. It's like, so the I think the micro book medium is really flexible. Um, you can do a lot with it. It can be like one of um, George Orwell's micro books, like, um, you know, he, he would have called them pamphlets, but it was like a few thoughts on toads. And I was like, mm. that's so cool. Cigarettes versus books. And I'm like, I don't, see how that could even be a comparison so now I desperately want to read that because Mm. it's like you know just little musings of whatever or it could be like one of my micro book clients wrote a book on procrastination but it wasn't uh, no perfectionism sorry but it wasn't just it wasn't like a massive deep thing it was like here are three or four tools that you can actually physically do she took an abstract concept which was perfectionism um, and put it into your body so it's like breathing are you breathing probably it's like the anxiety aspect of it and she turned it into a tangible thing in the space of like 80 pages um and that's another little tiny book that changed my life and so i just think mm. it can be that's what i mean by mighty um coming back to your question because it actually del- delivers a tangible outcome by <laughs> almost taking so let's take perfectionism as an example that's a big topic that if you were to tackle in a single book would require quite a large work counts but by kind of niching down within that and addressing one specific thing that is easy for the reader to implement or take action on or put into practice, you're yeah. providing a mighty outcome. Yeah. And I, I like to describe it as like a transformation. So quite often I'm finding when I work with people to write their micro books, um, they start off with too big an idea, right? It's too broad and it starts to become really bloaty. And that's not to say that a big book on the subject wouldn't be great because I, I reckon that Joanna might go on to write like a big book on perfectionism at some point. But like my thinking is, okay, what does, what do the people need to know before that? Okay. What do they need to know before that? It's like before, so if you're trying to teach somebody something if they're not in like the right mind frame to learn it there's no point right Mm. so for somebody to understand more about what they need to do for say perfectionism it's like maybe the maybe the best first step is for them to understand how it sits and feels in their body and what they can then do because once you understand what it is instead of it being an abstract idea you can then start to do more stuff and so we've found that with a couple of other people so like my friend Yinka who you've probably seen around on um, on LinkedIn, she's writing a micro book on cash, and like everybody thinks they know what ca- knows what cash is and cash flow mm. is, but actually most people don't. And so we think about sales, we think about income, we think about all that stuff, but without cash flow and an understanding of that, the rest of it doesn't matter because you don't have a business without cash flow. And so she's gone ramped it right back, right back to the beginning. It's like, what do people need to understand before they can do anything else? She's taken the problem back to first principles, mm. and after addressing the problem from first principles, you could build on that from there. Maybe with a series of books. Maybe, but yeah, I mean, I know that she's or, right. or a bigger book that follows. If if people like the, if people like yeah. the micro book, maybe they'll like the macro book. Exactly, yeah, and that's you know that's a, a thing that people can do as well. It's like write a series of micro books, and then maybe they become chapters in a macro book, even. But like my my key thing for micro books and for any book, like even fiction books, is like what's the transformation? It's not just writing for the sake of it. It's like. In a, in a fiction book, you're looking for the transformation of the protagonist, I guess. How do they change over time? And in the non-fiction book, it's like, how do you want the reader to change over time? You know, if I if I read a book, I'm not just like subconsciously, I'm not, you know, I'm just I'm just reading it like consciously. It's like I just want to read this because it's interesting. But subconsciously, I'm always looking for that transformation. So like, how am I going to see the world differently after I finish reading this book? Or, you know, is my mind going to be changed? Am I going to learn something that shifts my worldview a little bit? And most people don't think about that consciously, but I think that's what most of us want when we read a book. It's like we want that transformation because otherwise, what's the point? Mm. Do you think people who are writing a micro book maybe need to kind of really niche down on, on a particular audience a lot more to focus that in because Maybe you want, you only want to focus on the person who's actually going to be able to achieve that transformation, or has the problem that is the starting point that's going to enable that kind of arc, that kind of character arc, to happen. 
I think so yeah and I'm going to use uh, profit first as another example of that so I'm not his ideal audience I'm not interested in the numbers and the figures rightly or wrongly I'm just not mm. going to do it and so if he had if he was thinking of turning the first chapters into a micro book then someone like me would be his perfect person it's like not just not interested in the finance side of things just not um but I still have this this need to understand how you know how to how to go from being a person who scrabbles for their taxes every month to mm. like to, to the other way around and so like he yes I think in that case he's got this audience and you know he, he pitched this book perfectly to his audience it just happens that I read the first bit um but if he was looking to create um, different books for different audiences then yeah he would look at okay well who is reading just the first three chapters of that book people like me um who is reading the like nerdy boring stuff about spreadsheets maybe that could be a micro book or maybe you know that's who he aims his whole book at so yeah I would say you know thinking about for people who are listening to your podcast thinking about what kind of a micro book they want might want to write is like a micro book is a tiny entry-level product for people so maybe the best way to approach that would be what do people need to know before they start working with me mm. or what do they need to know before they might want to be interested in buying my um you know my next price product or whatever so that's probably a good way of looking at it is like you don't necessarily want to put a lot of time and effort into educating people putting courses together for people you know or you know putting products together for people who are further down the road but it's a really nice way to bring new people into your world without too much well I mean once it's written it's written it's like you don't have to write it and rewrite it so does that make sense it does yeah so you can bring people in you can tell some of your story you can establish trust without going into the details and maybe there's an option at the end for people who want to come into the details to to take the next step, whether that's a bigger book, whether that's a course, whether that's working with you one on one, however that looks. Yeah. So, when you're listening to this, it's kind of given me ideas for. I have, I have a nagging feeling about my simple story selling book, which has evolved into a sort of fairly big book. It's almost like 300 pages long, but it's actually like not not everyone needs to read all of, all of that. Like, there's quite a lot of stuff in there. Like, not everyone needs to know the seven steps to write a decent story. Like, if you're not actually going to write your own emails, you probably don't need to read that part of the book. Yeah. Um, not everyone needs to know about Christopher Booker's seven basic plots and how they can be applied into business. It's 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 something that I could actually split off into separate books. Yeah. And I, I, I've known this sort of, um, I've known this for a while, but kind of suppressed it because it's like, mm, I've kind of already done the work. Um. Would you consider like taking an existing body of work like that and kind of splitting out certain topics? Absolutely. Yeah, 100 percent. And there's a couple of reasons for that, partly for the reasons that we've just talked about with like bringing people in at different levels, but also because um, like and I'll use my book as an example here. How the hell do you write a book? It's it, That's quite chunky as well. It's a big book um, and it takes you through literally everything you need to know. Some people are going to love that. They're going to dive in and they're going to be like, oh, this is great. Other people um, and sometimes I am people is like that's too much like it's just overwhelming and so if you give them those bite-sized pieces because it's really easy to say I'll oh, just read it one chapter at a time but our brains do not work like that we no, see a no, big no. thing and it's it's scary so that's another reason to do it if you're like you know we don't have to appeal to everybody all the time but I do think that we try and teach too much because we've been sold this idea that value is more like it's always mm -hmm. more it's more information more of this you've got to like pile more stuff on but if I see like if I see a product that I want and they pile loads and loads and loads and loads of bonuses on I often walk in the other direction because I'm like that is too much I know that I'm not going to use all of those bonuses um yeah. I just want to learn this one thing and so if uh, if their bonuses are one-to-one -one call with them that's awesome because that's like okay cool I can do the thing and then I can have a chat but if the bonus is like oh and you get these 53 courses as well I'm like absolutely not that's oh, no, 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 too, too much. much it's too much for me um and so that's that kind of thinking was was another one of the reasons why I got thinking about micro books it's like how can we simplify this for people I don't think it's about attention spans because our attention spans haven't changed like brains don't change that quickly but I do think that we're busier um we're busier we're more stressed and all the rest of it and so if we can make it simpler for people it's like teach them one thing like give them one idea one idea to chew on and then maybe they'll be ready for the next idea and the next idea and some people like to do that sequentially in big books um mm. and but many of us don't and like even if you're dipping a toe in so like I'm learning to knit at the moment um <laughs> it's that's, that's such a grandma activity I'm afraid to say <laughs> well I don't know my, my friend Ed who is also a trapeze teacher he knits he is definitely not grandma okay. and Tom Daly hey yep. Tom Daly knits anyway so but I was like I want to be very wrong 
I want I want to learn to knit and so but I'm so far at the beginning of my journey that I'm not even in book territory yet so I'm in YouTube territory um and so well, if somebody this is was what to we're doing because me... YouTube is a problem solution environment and actually what you're doing with a micro book is solving one problem and that means that you can almost almost like if you were to think about it from an SEO or keyword sense it's like each book can cater more specifically to a particular problem even to a particular search query or to a particular route in mm-hmm. um and it kind of gives you much greater coverage like that because that's what you would do if you were implementing a YouTube strategy. Exactly. Yeah. And so I just, I just think that, yeah, exactly what you've just said, you know, and, and for people, cause I, I will help people write those books. And I do help people write those books. And I also help people write books who are like, Oh, you know, what? I've just, like the on reading book. It's like, it's not, it's not really like kind of is solving a problem, but not like overtly. And it's just like, here are some thoughts of mine on how I read books. And it's mm. like, that's really interesting. I'm doing a similar thing with my, a micro book that I'm writing at the moment um, about what's well, for writers with ADHD. And it's not it's not a how to book. It's not an instruction book, but it's just like, here are some thoughts. Here are some things that I've learned. Here are some little stories. And I hope that people get something out of it. And it doesn't have to be overt. It doesn't have to. But it's going to be another way for people to get to know me and who I am. And so there isn't, you know, there are formulas and I, there are templates and things that I work with people to use. But also there there is a space for people to just go, you know, I'm just going to fling a bunch of thoughts down, turn it into a micro book and pop it out there. And like I say, fling, it'll be edited and it'll be a good book and all the rest of it. There's but more it's work like a, that goes into it than just flinging it together. But like, yeah. yeah. But it can start like that, you know, it doesn't have to start with a framework and a, and a strategy and and a, and a kind of, you know, all encompassing business plan. It can just start with, I've got this cool idea. And I think, I think other people might be quite interested in it. I think the appealing thing as well is like, if you're writing shorter books, you can publish them a lot faster. You can get feedback on them a lot faster. You can start getting Amazon reviews and everything else a lot faster, yeah. which kind of snowballs into this kind of cumulative effect. Yes. How long? Okay. So there's a few questions. So if someone's, thinking about this like how long realistic typically might a micro book be and how long would you say for someone who isn't a writer how long should it take to write one okay so i think of micro books as being sub 100 pages so okay. less than 100 pages um george orwell's politics in the english language is 24 pages um a couple of the ones that i've i'm helping to usher through at the moment are between 40 and 80 pages mm. um so sub 100 pages maybe 10, 12,000 words. Um, but honestly, it's kind of up to you. So that's the kind of length. Um, how long it takes to write really depends on how much time you've got. But my micro book course is four weeks. So I'm aiming for people to have that first draft done and maybe some editing done within that four weeks. And then I've had people get it, you know, up and published within six to eight weeks. So mm. it can be that quick. Do you ever have people who kind of record the content uh verbally first and then convert that into written rather than sitting at the keyboard because it's terrifies them. Absolutely. And I tell people to do that as well. So um, if, if somebody is really struggling, like I have a client who speaks all of her books into her voice notes while she's pacing around and walking around and stuff. Um, I have other clients who freeze when they sit in front of a keyboard. And so like writing doesn't mean necessarily sitting in front of a keyboard and, or a piece of paper and writing words on paper. It's like, it's thinking in a in a way that is recorded so if that's like you know yeah. if you're recording it with words that's fine but yeah I'm all about you know if you are finding yourself stuck imagine that you are having a like imagine that we are like I could take this this conversation that we're having and turn that into a micro book get the transcript it, and yeah. yeah get the transcripts because it's going to be a really natural way to do it because I think a lot of the time people will sit down and they're like I have to write a book and it becomes this thing and it's like and I, I'm not a writer how do I do this um whereas if they imagine that they are having a conversation with a friend or somebody who's asking them you know questions about their topic that can become a really natural way of doing it because they are not fettered then by this idea by this pressure of like being a writer it's like I just need to talk passionately about the thing that I care about for Mm -hmm. 20 minutes would they need to kind of dictate it like just imagine the conversation or would they be better doing it in dialogue or does the kind of dialogue make it harder to subsequently edit into a book I mean it would depend on I would say it would depend on who's writing and, and kind of what their aims are but like I like the idea, like I've read some really good books that are dialogue. I mean, didn't Plato write his dialogues? Um, yeah, yeah, probably, yeah, I think so. Way yeah, back it's, when. It, it's discourse. not a new idea, is it? It's not a new idea, no. And so that can work really well because it's quite an engaging way of, 
of doing things but um so it depends on on what kind of book you want to write but I would say you know some people find it really useful to write themselves out a series of interview questions and then answer them some people find it really useful to get their partner or a friend or a colleague or whatever to kind of interview them almost um people going on podcasts like I would you know if people have got an idea they're talking about it they've done a lot of podcast interviews just get the get the transcripts from those podcasts and start with that that's a really good mm. place to start because podcast interviewers are generally really good at pulling um not just like information out but pulling that expertise out as well it's like I always feel a massive confidence boost after I've done a podcast because you sit there and you think actually I I know a lot more than I think I do um, and it's it's done in a natural way and, I, and so I'm a really big fan of people doing that when they're coming to write their book it's like get someone to interview you because one of the things that gets in the way is that feeling of oh do I actually know enough to write a book and it's like yeah you do you absolutely do it's just that we forget how much we know when somebody mm. doesn't ask us about it so I think that can be a really powerful thing to do. This is like 90% of what I do is just interviewing people who think they haven't got an interesting message but actually when you interview them you ask a few questions and then the floor gets open and then I take the raw material of that and then pick out kind of seams of coal, if you like, or gold mm. and tr try to find the veins <laughs> yeah. that um, that are obvious to me because I'm a, I'm a step removed from them. So it's a bit more obvious to see. Yeah. Um, every time, I think what's maybe interesting is that I find it much easier to do this for clients than I do to do for myself because... Um, I guess I'm just too close to my own thoughts of my own work, maybe. Yeah, everybody does. Everybody finds it more difficult to... I think I find it much easier to write about myself now than I did because I've practised a lot. Um, mm. And a lot of the stuff that I'm doing for my MA is um, like essay, like personal essays and things. So I'm like, you know, I'm like, oh, what could I write about today? I'm like, I write about my weird habits for eating cheese. And I actually just did that for an assignment. So, um, but it was like, that. that is a way of writing about yourself as well. It's like, it doesn't always have to be you know the the kind of the bio the elevator pitch whatever it's just like it's write about your quirks and kind of start getting used to that mm -hmm. um but I loved I love what you said about kind of being too close to it because I think people do it's like you are too close to it it's like your your life is mundane because it's your life and it's mm -hmm. every day like I had a client who has had literally the craziest life um Drayton Bird <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> two separate women tried to stab him and he's just like oh my life's really boring and I'm like dude <laughs> and so even he thinks his life is boring because he lives it every day and so that's why I think it's really useful for somebody like you to come along and pull those stories out of people mm. I think though even if you do end up doing talking monologue and kind of dictating it like it does get easier than what you do it like the first 40 odd episodes of this podcast were me talking monologue and I started it because I felt I had various things in my head that I wanted to say that was going to take quite a long time to write and I felt there was more value in just talking through it and like the first episode I, I had to do so much editing to try and get it into a publishable state and then you know with, with more practice you kind of get used to it a bit yeah yeah definitely it's the same with writing it's you know it's it's a muscle like one of my one of my recent clients she she did the micro book course she undenied about it she was told in college by an English teacher you can't write and you'll never be able to write and I would really like to punch that English teacher Ooh. in the face it's like what kind of a person goes into teaching and then says that to somebody do you know what I mean that's so but damaging, like, yeah yeah and so it was just like don't a don't do don't be mean <laughs> just don't be mean um and b it's just not true like anybody can become a good writer if they practice enough it's not I don't unless like there is a certain there is there is a certain amount of natural talent with stuff like physical mm. stuff like Michael Phelps is literally built to be an amazing swimmer right I'm never going to be able to swim like him nor are you nor is most like 99.9% .9 of people because we are not physically built like he is but like leaving all of that aside leaving like the top you know 0.1% aside anybody can become really good at something if they practice it and mm. so if you never start then you're definitely never going to become good at it what she maybe could have said was you're unlikely to be the next Stephen King however don't let that you stop know, you don't let that stop you <laughs> yeah exactly and you know who's to say she'd want it to be the next bloody Stephen King anyway it's like and, and that's another thing it's like people thinking oh I'm never going to be the next Stephen King it's like no you're going to be the next you and mm. that's that's the other thing is like yes when we learn to write like I've done a lot of emulating other writers like I love David Sedaris um I love um, Maya Angelou I love Toni Morrison I love all the writers like that and I mm -hmm. will rewrite stuff in their style and because that's how we learn what our what our own voice is but ultimately mm -hmm. I don't want to write like any of them because I will be a pale and crappy imitation of them I want to write as 
good as I possibly can, whatever good mm. means. Um, and so I think that's a useful thing for people to take away as well. Well, that's, that's, the, that's the magical thing about writing and publishing is it's, it is kind of snapping shut on like a butterfly almost that you're kind of framing for future. So someone, so it's like having a butterfly in a book that you preserved mm. and someone can open that book in the future and look at that and get the message and get the voice that was in your head at that time. So it's almost like you're time traveling to different places and yeah. and scaling what you have to say, which is kind of the whole point of this surely is scaling your impacts and helping more people and delivering a positive change to your corner of the world and whatever that looks like. And surely that's what we're here to do. That's what I think so. Yeah, I think so. It's I have heard writing described as time travel before, and I think it's a really good way of doing it. It's like you can, you know, you'll be able to reach people hundreds of years in the future. We're still reading stuff that's thousands of years old, you know, and that like I I just it boggles me to think that when the people who wrote that wrote it, I bet they did not think there would be people reading it in thousands of years. And just I would love to see their faces now when they're like, what? People are like still what? <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's really boggling. So, yeah, I think it's it's about leaving that that impact and it's about getting your story out and your point of view and being able and especially especially now that we've kind of democratized publishing a little bit and we can self-publish it's like mm. there aren't gatekeepers anymore and that's a good thing because you know traditionally publishers have a very fixed idea of who they want to publish and it's changing slowly but like we've got all of these different voices now who's who's stories need to be told um and i'm going to use prince harry as an example not because he's underprivileged because he most definitely isn't but uh, people have been like ragging on him because he's released his autobiography right his memoir like I don't blame him at all because he's spent the whole of his life having the media tell god knows what lies about him and and telling his story for him and so he has been screaming into the void he's been you know he's been spent spent his time trying desperately to tell his story nobody's listened so he's like you know what fuck it I'm gonna write my story in my book mm -hmm. and you know he's extremely privileged and all the rest of it but i can't imagine what it must be like to be somebody of whatever privilege having your voice taken away because that is what mm. the media did to it's him. so provocative to do that exactly and, you know, if people want to read it then that yeah like, yeah and then you think about all of the other people who don't have all of his advantages and all of the people whose voices traditionally haven't been heard like you know writers of color black writers people from the lgbt community people who would never ever get a book publishing contract under a kind of perhaps going a bit further back in time but it would have been very difficult yeah and think like i say things are changing not fast enough but you know they, those people all now have access to get their stories out there and get their stories heard and have them and have other people like it's an empathy thing right we can't mm. we can't understand what we can't see and we can't care about what we don't understand so it's it's that when you're talking about making a positive impact on the world that's what i'm thinking about is like how do we you know how do we leave the world a little bit better than when we started how do we leave it with a little bit more kindness and i think the way to do that is storytelling and i think the best way to do that is books because they last mm, and empathy is the entire basis of storytelling i mean there's quite a lot of fiction authors who say that when they really get involved into into writing a work of fiction and you get in the heads of your characters it makes you a little bit better at understanding other people because you started off by understanding yourself on a deeper and more fundamental level and that in itself is probably a reason to to write a hundred percent yeah i don't think most people spend much time at all digging into their own psyches and their own who they are um mm. i think more people in our space will because i think entrepreneurs tend to be a little bit more self-reflective but like people just don't like they're too busy they're too selfish they're too whatever and uh, you know i'm trying not to be judgy about it but like as soon as you start digging into to writing a book it's like it's exactly like you say you have to do you have to become more self-aware and that means looking at your own biases and your own you know the habits and all of that stuff that goes with it and that starts to make you look outwards and, and think okay so where could I do better in the world where am I doing damage in the world where you know where can I understand like just start with where can I understand that person better and mm. kind of digging in and you know not necessarily not telling other people's stories for them but digging in and figuring out and reading their stories is a really good place to start mm. I wanted to go back to the democratization of publishing mm. so are you using Amazon KDP or how are you getting people's um, books out into the world? So um, I find the whole process extremely onerous. So I don't do that for people. Um, I, I kind of show them where to start. Um, mm. But I have got some stuff on Amazon KDP, um, but I really like using Ingram Spark. So mm. Ingram is one of the world's biggest book distributors anyway. And Ingram Spark is their online 
self-publishing um, and they distribute to everybody including Amazon um, and so they'll get it out all over the place so I like to use Ingram partly because I like to do things once rather than twice um, mm. I don't need to do it for Amazon if I've done it for Ingram um, and partly because I would like to rely a bit less on Amazon um, and again I know that not everybody has that luxury um, but and I know a lot of people's livelihoods depend on Amazon so I'm certainly not you know, I'm not saying don't do it or being judgy about it, but like I would like to use Amazon less. So for me, that's um, Ingram Spark is a really good way of doing it. And there are other platforms now as well that are that are coming up. There's bookshop.org, um, mm. which is I buy as many books as I can from there now. Um, and, you know, you can there's also Ingram Spark will distribute to bricks and mortar bookshops as well and make it available. And there are ways that, you know, if you build relationships with local bookshops and things like that, that's a really good way to start getting your self-published books out into the world. And I think as well, because there are so many self-published books now traditional publishing is going to become less and less important it's becoming more of a vanity thing rather than a you know than a than a kind of mark of you know credibility or whatever and so I think it's going to become easier to get your book I don't no I don't think that's true it's not going to become easier to get your book into bookstores because I don't think it's ever been easy to do that but I do think it will become more of a level playing field and that traditional books will be less likely to be given a lot of weight over self-published books um mm. so I, I think that i think there'll just be more opportunities for people mm. i mean i guess bookshops will sell what, whatever people want to buy exactly yeah it doesn't actually matter who's published it or where it's coming from i also realized going through this with my own book that there's a lot of people who specialize in the various parts of the publishing process that i maybe do not want to deal with i'm not very good at like i'm not a great line editor uh, I don't really do typesetting very well. Um, I, I I can do all of these things, but, but probably shouldn't. Uh, cover design, I can get version 0.1 up for you really quickly, but you know you don't really want to use it forever. Yeah. Um, actually, there's there's because independent publishing has become quite a real thing. There's various people who specialize in these things, and yeah. you know you can kind of leverage that, I guess. Yeah, there's so many people doing so many amazing things. So like I use a piece of software called Vellum to typeset my books. It's available only on the Mac, but like if people are listening and they're like, oh, I want to write, I know I want to write more than one book. Um, it might be worth investing in Vellum because, um, you know, the, do two books and it will have paid for itself in terms of paying somebody else to do the typesetting. Right. Um, does basic stuff. Um, so basic is kind of standard stuff. If you want anything fancy typesetting wise, lots of images, that kind of thing, go to a professional typesetter. But yeah, there are also people who will, you know, do all of the getting your book up onto um, the distribution centers. So like Ingram Spark or Amazon, there are people who will help you do that. Um, there are cover, obviously cover designers all over the place. There are some great ones on Fiverr as well. I know people are a bit snotty about Fiverr, but there are some great cover designers on Fiverr. Um, there are also some great cover designers off Fiverr. Mm. Um, there's typesetters, there's like you say, line editors, editors. Um, I really use Pro Writing Aid um, a lot. It's like a Grammarly, but different version. Um, that's really great. Like if you're on a tight budget, at the very least invest in something like Pro Writing Aid or Grammarly and you know make make sure that that works and now we've got ai tools as well they're gonna i think they're gonna be um people are gonna be using those as well for things like proofreading and and line editing um and so there's some really interesting developments coming out in terms of, of technology that people will be able to use as well so this is my last question so obviously there's um chat gpt seems to have burst onto the scene in the last to, to me in the last few weeks and i i know that that's not the case i just don't pay that much attention to these to, to these things but it was noteworthy to me that all of a sudden various people in completely different fields, not marketing related, were talking about it. And I thought, well, that probably means there's something worth paying attention to. And I wondered, um, perhaps not even specific to chat GPT, but that kind of technology, what role do you uh, kind of foresee it playing? So this is, yeah, I find this really interesting. There's been a lot of outrage um, about it and I find outrage extremely boring um, because it's not very thoughtful. Um, I'm not going to touch on kind of the gray area of the ethics of taking art that's already out there and kind of creating something else from it. Because it's an assimilation I, tool, I guess. But, yeah, because I don't yeah. really know enough about that and I, I, I'm not going to talk about it. But in terms of a, a tool for writers, I think it's super useful because certainly for me, like if I start researching something, um, like I started researching George Orwell and ended up knowing almost everything you can possibly know about whirlpools don't even ask how but that's like my research process it's really fr it's interesting but it's really frustrating if I want to get something done quickly and I think that chat GPT and AIs like that will just be really useful because I like just ask it questions and it will provide you don't have to go looking you don't have to disappear down a YouTube wormhole because chat GPT will go down the rabbit holes instantly and return something vaguely sensible to you that will shortcut that process Exactly. Yeah. And like, I would say to people, treat it like Wikipedia, treat it as a place to start, like don't treat it as gospel because it's, you know, it's 
not necessarily going to be totally 100% correct. But like, yeah, use it for research, um, use it as a starting point. So like, if you're stuck for if you're like, oh, I want to write a book about emus, for example, it's like, chat G GPT, tell me 10 things about emus, that can be a really good place to start. And so those 10 things, and then tell me 10 more, and then tell me 10 more. And it's like, that's going to spark off ideas. So it's like an idea generation thing. Um, it's not going to write its thing for you, although I'm sure we will see lots of um, lots of books written by AIs. Um, and I know people have been kind of, oh, AI is going to steal our jobs. It's like, that's been the thing ever since industrialization. So I'm not particularly worried about that. But my other thought on it was, you know what? If an AI can write a sales page better than I can, let it get on with it. Because that to me is like, why would I waste my time doing it when I could mm. then create something human? Because I think this is the thing that people have a profound misunderstanding about right? with, with creation and, and art and things that we create. Because I do see all writing, including copywriting as art, is like, if you tell an AI to create something, it will create it and it'll probably do a really good job and like, it'll paint a beautiful landscape, whatever. But that to me is boring because I'm like, why that landscape? Why did the painter choose to paint that thing? Why did the writer choose to write this story? And that to me is what's really interesting is like the human it's story. It's the caption under the picture. How much yeah, the picture. it is. Yeah, it's the reason below it. And so like, yes, it can be beautiful and all the rest of it. But I think subconsciously, and again, most people don't think about this consciously, but subconsciously, it's not the painting that we're interested in. It's the human story behind it. And so we can kind of look at that painting and think, oh, you know, Edvard Munch painted the scream. It's like, God, what kind of a mindset must he have been in to paint that picture, you know? And it just sends you down that really interesting rabbit hole. It's like Van Gogh and his like ear phase. It's like all of that stuff. And AI is just... It can't do that because it doesn't, all it has is the parameters that we give it. And so for me, that kind of art is not, it's never going to be as interesting, you know? It's mm. not, and if it does get to the point where it's sentient, then it becomes interesting because then it's like, well, it's going to have its own reasons for doing so. And that in itself becomes interesting. Either that or we're all totally fucked because robots have taken over the world. Who knows? So didn't they make a film about that once? I think they, I think they did. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, Skynet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Something like that. The Matrix. Yeah. Mm. Um, so yeah, that, that's my thoughts about how AI can be used in a nutshell. So your, your role in your business is to be human because AI is not human. It is comp it ultimately it's computational. So anything that is computational should probably, will probably be done by AI when the tools are available, but that shifts your availability, your headspace to yeah. higher value work of being authentic, being you communicating that communicating, you know, deciding fundamentally what your message is and who you stand for. And like, yeah. as far as I'm concerned, like, I, I don't see currently how AI can really tell your story. Like, I think it's no. from you. It can give you a start. It can give you a place to start. It can give you some ideas. And that, is, at the moment, is as far as it can go. And I think that's really useful because I think it's going to be a really useful tool in helping people to get over that blank page hump that they often get to. It's like suddenly you're not faced with a blank page. You're faced with some information that AI has pulled out and then you get to take that and do something interesting with it. And that that's where it becomes interesting. It's like exactly what you said. It frees us up to do the higher value work and, you know, it forces us, it pushes us as humans to become more interesting and to become more human and to evolve in whatever direction we evolve in. And I think that that is a good thing. You know, I don't think that we should be just wanting to churn out the same. like there's enough robotic shit churned out by humans as it is already so like if you're worried about ai taking your job then my suggestion would be become more fucking interesting you know <laughs> yeah and i think uh I remember sean d'souza saying years ago that even if there's like a hundred other people doing what you do like people want to hear from you people want your take on it people want your perspective um people want to hear your experience yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. And that's where, you know, that's where the generic advice that an AI can throw out is going to fall down because like, I just Googled the other day, you know, tell me about um, AD, uh, writer, writing tips for people with ADHD and it threw out a bunch of ideas. And then from there, I'm writing my own experience because like, they want to hear how, you know, what I've done, the things that I've struggled with, the the wormhole, you know, how I ended up knowing about whirlpools when I started off with George Orwell, that that's the kind of, you know, that's the kind of thing that people are going to resonate with. It's like, if you just give people facts, that's boring. It, we're back to story again, right? <laughs> we're back to telling a story and, you know, why did this happen and where has it gone and how do we get people to relate? Because people will read that, like, I've I love memes. Like memes are a really good example. Like memes are a really good form of communication because I look at so many memes. Like, oh, I've spent most of the last two years sending memes around so I can relate to that. Yes. 
yeah exactly it's like this is how I communicate with one of my best friends who also has ADHD it's just like mm. me, me, me. But it's like I will I will read them and I'm like oh my god that like perfectly describes what's going on in my head and it's that connection and so you know it can be really short form or it can be longer form but it has to be it has to be personal and it has to be from you mm. I have two thoughts so we're pretty much out of time but um I kind of think we should convert the transcript of this of this episode into a micro book or at least look at it because yeah, <laughs> I yeah. think that'd be really interesting yeah yeah um and then secondly how can people uh find out more about your work how can people follow you maybe sub- subscribe to your email list oh I would love people to subscribe to my email list and um, they can go to moxiebooks.co.uk um and there are sign up links all over the place but if you go to forward slash notes in the margin that's my email sign up um I am tiny beetle steps on Instagram and Twitter um I am on LinkedIn as Vicky Quinn Fraser book coach I think um if you google my name you'll find me um and yeah best place to start really is is with with my book um my big book at the moment but I'm I've got various micro books coming out so keep an eye out for those Mm. so moxie books is m-o-x-i-e yes 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 perfect okay I'll make sure I'll make sure we put links to all of those things in the show notes thank you so much (laughs) great well I think this has been a great conversation so um thanks for joining me Thank you very much for having me. It's been lots of fun. If you've enjoyed this episode of the Story Copywriter Podcast, you'll want to make sure you're on my email list. When you sign up at storycopywriters.com forward slash podcast, I'll also send you my seven-day storytelling crash course free by email. Please also make sure you've got a copy of my simple story selling book, which is available from Amazon in paperback and Kindle formats. Thanks for listening. I'll talk to you next time.